So can you talk a little bit about um, how you feel about doing this? I'm a little apprehensive. I'm not all the way comfortable with what my, you know, what I look like with no clothes on. So can you talk um, about when you first remember having issues with your weight and with your body? I was born 13 pounds. It's so funny because when my mom went back to Haiti with me, like I was had a full head of hair. I looked like I was months in. <laughs> but the first time I remember it being an issue was when I came back to the States and I, went, I was in preschool. I was getting teased miserably. I used to pretend to pass out so that I wouldn't have to stay in school. <laughs> and I would practice at home how I was gonna fall so I wouldn't hurt myself. And uh, my mom thought that something was really wrong with me. I'm like, mom, I'm pretending, girl. I don't want to, I just, I don't want to be here. And she really thought for years that something was really wrong with me. I was so casted out that I found entertainment in my own room. I call it my magical, magnificent room I had music there, I had art there, I had, I could express myself there. High school was a little bit better. I pretended that I was okay with being in the shell that I was in and it was like, I was fat yesterday, I was fat last week and I'm probably gonna be like, finding a joke. It was like a fake confidence. I was always like the best friend to every popular guy. But then came the I would always fall for every guy that I was like best friends with because, you know, we're friends. And so they expressed things to me that they wouldn't normally tell everybody else. And then there was the guys that I was friends with that secretly did have feelings for me, but didn't want to be, I wasn't what aesthetically would, would be the norm that they would date. And so I was like the closet the closet piece. <laughs> I've ruined friendships over the fact that I had, you know, feelings and didn't know how to deal with the fact that they didn't have that same thing for me. And I think um, all of it is a direct cause of my formal years, not having my father and I had a stepdad that made it clear to me that he was my stepfather and that, you know, anything that he did for me just know that I don't have to do this. That abandonment and then going to school and still being shunned and, mm, so it's just, you know, imagine going through life never actually being wanted. Were you happy with your body or were you unhappy with your body? Based on how other people viewed me, I wasn't happy. And so then I became conditioned to thinking, no, that's not what you should look like, and you should be this other way, you know? My mom tried to make me, you know, camps, and she even got me um, to have gastric bypass surgery when I was 17 when I graduated. But it was the OG one, like I have a big scar right here. And they cut out three quarters of your stomach and then t attached the pouch to the small intestine and you can only eat two ounces. But naturally, your stomach is a muscle, so the more you feed it, the more it expands. So after that surgery, I gained all of the weight back. Um, how, how much did you, how, what did you get how, from? How, where I capped off at it was like 100 pounds. When I was 17, I was 368 pounds. I didn't want to have the surgery per se. That, like, that was my mom's decision. Um, I think she had more of a problem with my weight then than I, than I did. Losing weight is an easy thing. It's the mental weight that um, was a hard thing. It's not until now that I'm like, hey, you're dope. You're, you're all right. <laughs> So you had said that you, you found your voice. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? I never wanted to be a singer. I didn't grow up wanting to be a singer. I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer and a manager. Uh, the singing thing happened by default because I started my professional career in music in 2007. I was a songwriter. I got tired of writing songs for free. I'd rather do it for me if I'm gonna do it for free. 
And I was writing these songs that were so true to myself because this is what I was going through. And everybody's looking for a hit or, you know, something that's radio friendly. And that's just not the space I was in at the time. So people passed on a lot of my songs, which became Sincerely Yours, which was my first EP and my first stepping and coming out. So what was the turning point? That time in 2010 when I uh, tried to commit suicide, the day after when I woke up and I was still here, I took whatever was in my medicine cabinet and I felt that moment where, you know, when you take anesthesia and you're like fading, I literally felt that like, in that moment it was just like, damn, I really did that. And I started thinking about my mom, how she was gonna fit, and then I went to sleep. But I think my weight helped absorb all that because I would wake up the next morning while everybody was passed out on my living room floor and I'm like up, like nothing happened. And so I feel like a lot of instances my weight was like a protective shield. Even as a teen, like if I was an attractive teen, I probably would have been a hoe. It had it been a, an, an attraction there, I probably would have been pregnant at 16. I wanted the attention. I wanted to be wanted and I wanted to be loved. You know, this is a male driven industry. So I never had that issue. It's always been about my talent and my vibe and whatever. So I've never had to compromise myself to get ahead. The men that I've come across in the industry would, from helping me pay rent when I didn't have it to just being there like that, those fathers, I call them the fathers that I never had. We went with a group of friends to Universal City Walk, and it was Halloween. And we waited online to get on this ride. I couldn't fit in with anybody else, so I was like in the last cart. And they were putting the lever down. The guy comes over and is checking everybody's thing. <laughs> and I was literally ready to fall out of that roller coaster and be like, I'll just hold on. <laughs> he presses down, he's like, wait, it's not going down. And then he pulls everybody's up again, and pulls it down, comes back to my cart, it's still not going down. He's like, lady, you're, you can't fit, so come on. And it was like mortifying. Everybody's like, oh yeah, no, we'll just get off too. And I'm like, mm -mm, I need this time. I said that walk of shame and I got it together before everybody got off the ride, but I was waiting there for everybody, everybody that I came with to go on the ride and then for me not to get on. And it's a small thing, but at the same time, like um, that was the first time I ever felt Fat. I knew I was overweight. I was the big girl. I was the fun big girl. But that was the first time I like I felt fat. All my music is autobiographical. Like I, I write exactly what I'm feeling and what I'm going through. At the time. It's like a purge. One of the most memorable sessions I've done. Um, that came out was uh, Rihanna Cheers, and when I did that session, I had <clears throat> I completely lost my voice, and I just had enough to pay rent, and somebody couldn't make it, so I became the replacement. That song and that session gave me hope. I just remember, like, okay, we got a food budget and a liquor budget. It's Friday. I called like 40 of my people's in, friends just hanging out. And we were all in the booth at the end of the song. And the lyric was saying, the life's too short to be sitting around miserable and people gonna talk whether you're doing bad or good. And that was a real sentiment. Life's too short to be sitting around miserable. And people gonna talk whether you're doing bad or good. I got a drink on my mind and my mind and my money. Looking so fine, gonna find me a honey. Yeah. Got my ray bands on and I'm feeling hella cool tonight. Right? Everybody's vibing, so don't nobody start a fight. Cheers to the freaking weekend. I drink to that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let the Jameson sink in. I drink to that. Yeah, yeah. Don't let the bastards get you down. Turn it around with another round. Everybody's at the bus. Better put your glasses up and not drink today. It's just a, 
it was for the everyday person struggling, working, you know, living life, and it's Friday, so forget all of that. We drinking tonight. <laughs> Going back to what when you realized that you were alive, you, and so what happened? What did you what What was your mindset, and what did you start to do? I woke up around noon, and I walked down Chandler Boulevard in North Hollywood as fast as I thought I could go. Day two was with Esther Dean. She's a, a songwriter friend of mine as well, and she got me on my path. Like we would start from like 26 and San Vicente all the way down the ocean, like just walking and it was blocks. And I, and I wasn't even thinking about the distance that we were walking because I was talking to her and she was so engulfed in her, you know, getting betterness, it, it helped me. It was almost like I was giving death to what was. It would take me forever to get ready because nothing was right, nothing fit right, nothing. I was like, you know what, less. When you say used to packing things on to hide whatever you're hiding. <laughs> when do you feel the most vulnerable? Naked in front of a guy for the first time. I'd be like. Like daytime sex, I, I'm, I wouldn't be that girl usually. I'm finally in a place where I, I'm a work in progress and I'm okay with loving me in the meantime. I'm forever becoming. That's, you know, that's the title of my album. Um, oh. The becoming, it's like an unfinished butterfly. You'll never be complete because completion is death. When do you feel the most beautiful? When I'm in the presence of other beautiful things. Feeling beautiful, like knowing and feeling it, because I forget what I look like sometimes. If I don't see myself enough, that's why I had to put up mirrors in my house. I don't do mirrors. I don't fixate myself in the mirror. I don't do selfies to check myself out. So I want my outside to reflect how colorful I feel and on the inside. What would you tell your 12-year-old self? Mm. To keep living. A lot of amazing things have happened, but I was just so stuck in my funk that I couldn't even appreciate what was going on at the time because I was either depressed about my past or anxious about the future and never present. I was in the studio with Puff, Puff Daddy the other day, and I remember being a kid growing up in New York City just loving his movement. And I worked with him, I've been working with him since like 2008, and it wasn't until the other day that I'm like, I'm in here with Puff Daddy. You know? This is actually a dream come true. And outside of my, you know, when you step outside of your own personal funk and misery and really observe life, it's not that bad. Why in your body is it a good place to be? We're gonna leave everything here when we leave wherever we transcend to. The inside is, is the thing that's gonna live forever. You'll always have your spirit and your soul and whatever you left people with. That was beautiful. That was amazing. How do you feel? Better. <laughs> Wasn't as hard as you thought? No. It was really like amazing. Thank you. Amazing, incredibly inspirational. Thank you.